Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to see so many of you this not so early morning. <laughs> but uh, you did the right choice because this is going to be a great talk, I promise. So today's session will be opened by uh, Professor Ruhl Bartz, who's coming from Ghent University. Professor Bartz is leading uh, one of the largest uh, silicon photonics groups in the world. Uh, his group is associated both with Ghent University and IMEC, and it's really uh, one of the leading groups in silicon photonics for the last, I believe, what, 20 years, right? Yeah, it's, it's around uh, 100, 100 people in his group, and uh, you know we have some uh, alumni of UCSB, so just to, to let them know, so whatever John Bauer says that he made the first hybrid laser, so they were two weeks before, so... <laughs> It's really, I mean, uh, a lot of the silicon photonics components, uh, technologies that are used today and are taken for granted, have been developed at Ghent University, at the group led by Professor Ruhl Bartz. He's uh, today one of the key figures in Europe, leading you know, the major consortiums that are, are directed towards uh, development in silicon photonics. And I see him as uh, really the, uh, the main person who is leading that effort to to make silicon photonics the technology of today, not of the future, right? So I'd like to, to, to you to welcome him, uh, to give you a talk about silicon photonics from transceivers to life science applications. It's really an exciting field, so I hope that you will have plenty of questions. Please welcome Professor Robarts. Thank you, Augustinas, for this very kind uh, introduction. Can you hear me well all through the room? Okay, thank you. So it's really a great pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me. It's, it's a privilege to be here, and I must admit, it's my first time in Lithuania, so that's also quite an opportunity for me. So let's try to get this started. <clears throat> so yes, the title here for today is Silicon Photonics. That's what I have been doing for the past uh, 20 years, approximately. Um, it's a field, as you will quickly see, that is rapidly developing and, and emerging, uh, not only from a scientific point of view, but also from an industrial uh, point of view. So let's immediately start with the simple question, what is silicon photonics? And actually, it can be summarized in one slide. Um, you take a microelectronic fab, a CMOS fab, that's where all our electronic digital chips are being made, but rather than using those technologies, and it's of course all silicon based, rather than using those technologies to make electronic chips, digital chips, you make light chips out of it, you make photonic chips out of it. And what you see, for example, here, this chip, for example, is, 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 is not a digital chip, it's a, it's a photonic chip, it's actually a sensing chip for glucose in, in blood. And if you do that, um, basically you can enable complex optical functionality on a compact chip and do it at the end of the day at low cost. Because that's the essence of doing things on a chip. You make something very small, it can be very complex, um, it, it, it will be very reliable, and at the end of the day, it has low cost. So in a nutshell, that is really what silicon photonics is all about. And the beauty of it is that to develop products in this field, you don't need to build your own new fab. Uh, microelectronics fabs are out there in the world and in, in many places, so you can use capacity, existing capacity in CMOS fabs for this purpose. So let me, with that, let me show an outline of what I'll be talking about. I'll in, introduce the field a bit more, of course, and then I'll briefly move to the actually the main driver industrially today, which is uh, high-speed optical transceivers. But I'm, I'll spend most of my time on what is closer to my heart today, which is uh, sensing and uh, life science applications of this technology. And I'll, time permitting, I will also talk a little bit about uh, what is considered a holy grail in this field, which is the integration of uh, lasers and light sources. So to introduce the field a bit more, and, and, and let me indeed uh, show with just one slide uh, this is just an, uh, from a web of science, uh, the number of publications in this field since about, uh, well, 20 years. Uh, and you see indeed uh, quite a rapid increase of uh, growth of this uh, field. Um, 
perhaps uh, 15 years ago, perhaps we said, hmm, perhaps this is a hype and it will disappear. Well, it's here to stay and it is, it, it is growing every year and now, the, and now it's industrial as well and there are products in the market. Um, why silicon photonics? Um, and the two things here up here are really the, the most important ones. Um, well, the second one I've already mentioned, you piggyback on 50 years of massive investment in the microelectronics CMOS industry. So you use um, CMOS technology, which is extremely mature, um, extremely powerful in, in what it can do in existing fabs, and it allows for low cost in volume. But there is something else, and that is called high index contrast. What I show here is actually just a simple waveguide. Um, a waveguide is, is the, the, the wire that carries the, the light, the, that, that carries the photons from one end of the chip to the other end of the chip. It's like an optical fiber, but then miniaturized to the extreme level. And in silicon photonics, this wire of light is made of silicon, uh, and silicon has a high refractive index of three and a half, and it's sitting, and it's actually embedded in silicon oxide, which is glass, which has a low refractive index, 1.45. So this is actually a waveguide, the core of which has a dramatically higher refractive index than the cladding. And if that is the case, you can really miniaturize your photonic circuits to the extreme. Um, uh, actually, the cross-section of this waveguide, and I think I have it on the a, on a, on a next slide, the cross-section of this waveguide is, you can see it here, is typically something like 500 nanometer wide by 200 nanometer high. So that's of the order of the wavelength of light. It's a single mode waveguide. Um, and because light is confined so strongly in this waveguide, you can make waveguides with very, very short bands. The, the, the band radius in an optical fiber, the band radius has to be as high as one centimeter or so. In these waveguides, the band radius can go down as, as, as low as uh, one or two micrometers. So you can make almost abrupt bands and light will not go out of the band, will, will still, without any loss, follow the band. So that's, um, that's one of, an, an important asset of these uh, silicon-based waveguides. I'll go back for a second. Um, now, these are not the only reasons, as you will see soon, uh, by, by making such waveguides. You can then make uh, passive devices, you can in integrate photodetectors, you can integrate modulators, you can do wafer level testing, etc., etc. Light source integration is a bit more demanding, but I'll come back to that later on. <clears throat> Okay, if you have, if you have a waveguide, then you, you can already start to design functions. Uh, and here is just, an, uh, this is a very old slide of us, uh, where we made an on-chip spectrometer. What you see here is an input waveguide. How it really works is that light comes in from this input waveguide. It's spread through this slab waveguide. It's split across all these waveguides. And there is a constant length uh, difference between all of them. Actually, this is a huge multi-arm interferometer with the consequence that because of the interferometric effect, at the output, different colors of light are focused down into a different output waveguide. And the overall function is, of course, a, a spectrometer or a wavelength demultiplexer, if you like. And you, here you see the uh, characteristic from this input to each of these output. And this is a simple example because it only has eight outputs, but you can scale this to dozens of outputs, even uh, 100 or 200 uh, different outputs. And mind the scale, uh, all of this function, and uh, I, I apologize here for this typo here, this is micrometer, this entire function fits onto a chip, which is uh, a small fraction of a square uh, millimeter. It's, it's a few hundred microns by a few hundred microns. So that is what you can do, and, and here you, again, here you see a typical uh, chip coming out of the fab. Um, and, and these are made on large wafers, of course, that, that drives down the cost of making such chips. This is a 200 millimeter wafer. And actually, we do even automated wafer level testing. What you see here is actually we couple light in from an optical fiber from above, and through a little diffraction grating, we couple light from the vertical fiber into the plane of the waveguide. Um, and with that, we can do wafer level testing, and that is actually visualized if all goes well. Oh no, I transferred my slides from my laptop to this. My video is not going to work, I'm sorry for that. Um, so I just said we make these waveguides of, of silicon on, on, on silica. Now uh, that works well, 
across a certain wavelength range. Silicon being a semiconductor, you can obviously not go below the band gap where silicon is heavily absorbing. And actually the, the transparency window of this waveguide is somewhere from just above one micron. This is where the, the band gap of silicon sits all the way up to something like four micron. That's where silicon oxide starts to be absorbing. Now, in certain applications, you would want to work in other wavelength ranges. So then, obviously, the question is, can you also make waveguides without leaving the CMOS fab, still making use of this uh, technology that you can uh, use from the microelectronics world in other wavelength ranges? And the answer is yes. Um, if you want to go down into the visible uh, part of the light spectrum, then all you have to do is, uh, for example, use silicon nitride as the core of the waveguide on silicon oxide. Or if you want to go deeper in the mid-infrared, one of the options, there are several, is to use a waveguide of uh, germanium grown epitaxially on silicon, and that will also buy you a, 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 actually a very large transparency window all the way across uh, to above 10 micrometers. So there are many, many options here. So that gives you a bit of an introduction. Uh, I'll take it now a little bit further um, into the what is today the mainstream driver of this whole field. And the mainstream driver is actually the data center. Uh, in data centers, there is a massive need for interconnection between thousands and thousands of servers um, across distances from a few meters to a few tens of meters to perhaps a few hundreds of meters um, with uh, uh, data rates in the order of tens to even hundreds of gigabit per second. And of course, the servers are all electronic, but doing the interconnect across tens of meters at those data rates electrically is simply not uh, economical. So we, you need to do it optically. You need optical fiber technology to do all the interconnects at massive scales in, in today's uh, data centers. And all the converters, you need almost millions of converters from electrical signals to optical signals in such a data center. Um, silicon photonics is now considered the prominent technology to do that. So you need transceivers, so that means that you need to be able to take an electrical signal and transfer it onto an optical signal and back into an electrical signal. Um, <clears throat> an important device here is an optical modulator. Uh, you, take, you take a CW laser and then you want to modulate it with a high bitrate uh, signal. The, the dominant technology by which this is done today in silicon photonics is by, you recognize here the waveguide again, and actually you build a PN junction around it, and then by applying a, a bias voltage, a reverse bias or forward bias voltage, you basically change the, the, the density of electrons and holes, the free electrons and holes in the semiconductor, and there is this, in semiconductors there is this so-called plasma dispersion effect, which simply implies that if you change the density of free electrons and holes, you actually change the refractive index by a small amount, but it's there. And by changing the refractive index, you can obviously change the optical phase. But then you want to change the optical intensity. Well, that's easy. If you know optics, you know all you have to do is combine that with an interferometer, typically, for example, a Magdzehnder interferometer, where this is a waveguide light is split in two. In one branch, you modulate the phase, and by interference at the output, you change the intensity of, of light. This, this, is a, this is a little workhorse. What I'm now describing is the workhorse of, of optical transceivers to indeed uh, convert an electrical signal applied to this diode into an intensity modulated uh, optical signal. And many groups have been doing that. I'll not go through these details, but it works very nicely and it works up to uh, data rates. The, the, the best results are, uh, are beyond 50 gigabit per second. So 50 billion times per second, you can switch light on and off with this uh, technology. The other thing you need is uh, photo detection to go back from a modulated optical signal to a modulated electrical current. Um, now, silicon itself is transparent, so that will not absorb light in a, in a detector. Here, the workhorse is this germanium photodiode in in microelectronics, it's well known how to grow high quality germanium onto silicon. And that is what we, we do here. Here again, you see here a structure where you have germanium grown on, on silicon. 
And basically, this is done at the end of a silicon optical waveguide. And then, of course, there is, again, uh, doping into a diode so that you turn into a photodiode. And the doping can either be lateral or it can be uh, vertical. Uh, and by that, you make a photodiode that converts the uh, optical intensity modulated signals into uh, photocurrent modulation. And again, that, that has been done by, by many groups. And with all these components, and I, what I've described now is actually sufficient to make these optical transceivers for the data center world. Um, and and uh, for example, IMEC, but this is just one example, I, I guess there must be, by now, there must be probably something like 20 uh, CMOS fabs in the world who have taken their CMOS technology to develop a process flow for what I've been describing now. And on such a process flow, you can then integrate uh, to the needs of your own designs. You can integrate passive optical structures. For example, this is a particular optical filter. Um, the, the modulators, and they come in, in a variety of uh, fashions. Uh, the high-speed modulators, 50 gigabit per second. The high-speed germanium photodiodes. Also structures to couple light in and out of the chip. Because you can imagine, I mentioned the waveguide is only 500 nanometer wide by 200 nanometer thick. Uh, coupling light efficiently into that sounds like a nightmare. Well, actually, it's not a nightmare. It's actually rather simple. And you can use, for example, these so-called uh, surface grating couplers. Uh, these are little diffraction gratings. You just bring a fiber vertically down to the chip. Um, this grating area is of similar size as the core of a single mode fiber. That's about 10 micrometer diameter. Light is incident on this diffraction grating, and it is diffracted into the plane of the waveguide and, and, and is then tapered down into, the, into that sub-micrometer uh, waveguide. And that works very nicely and, and, and very, very well. So this is basically what I'm describing here is today the, the standard type of silicon photonics as it is used for these uh, datacom applications. And, and this is just a, a slide to show what industry has then been doing. About 10 years ago, industry started to care about this and they, because they, they recognized the, the performance that you can achieve. And more importantly, they re recognized the beauty of the, the capability of just taking existing technological infrastructure. You need a couple of good designers to design those photonic chips. You let it make in a foundry and you're done and you have a product. So that's what many companies are now doing. So I, I list here many companies, both companies that are end users, like whatever, uh, Finisar, uh, there is Intel, I'm sure, there is, um, there is uh, Sienna, uh, uh, there is also Calliopa, actually. Calliopa, I'm, I'm proud to say, is a spin-off from my group. But, I, uh, but uh, a few years after we founded it, it was acquired by Huawei, but it's still sitting on our campus at uh, Ghent University, and it's, it's uh, employing 30, 40 uh, uh, photonic integration engineers to develop these uh, products. You also see here some of the uh, players that fabricate the chips. There is ST Microelectronics in Grenoble, France. There is Global Foundries. These are really the, the, the fabs. Um, and the, and the, the recent, most recent addition here is, and that's quite impressive actually, is TSMC. TSMC is the, is the biggest pure play foundry in the world. It's, the, it's in, 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 in Taiwan. Uh, that's the biggest uh, electronic foundry of this world. And they decided a year ago to, uh, to build a process flow for silicon photonics so to be prepared for high volume manufacturing of these um, Transceivers. And transceivers, I've simplified it a bit, but it comes in many varieties. Uh, there are active optical cables, there are wavelength division multiplexing transceivers, there are coherent transceivers, um, the, 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 there are devices for fiber to the home. So it's not all about uh, data centers, it's, all, it's about fiber optics in, in general. Um, of course, uh, Ethernet uh, from 40, 50, 100, and now the, f the, the focus is really to develop, to develop 400 gigabit per second uh, Ethernet uh, transceivers. So this is where we stand today with uh, this technology. It has really been a remarkable ride from the 20 years ago where we started playing with this technology and where we didn't foresee at all this uh, industrial take-up. 
it was just scientific fun to use very mature silicon technology to do photonic fun. Basically, that was the situation 20 years ago to the situation that you see on this uh, slide. But uh, with that, I'd like to move to um, the same technology, but now in completely different uh, markets and, and fields. I'd like to move to sensing and, uh, and life science. Um, first of all, a few words in general about uh, applications of integrated devices in, in, um, in medicine and life science. Um, I always like to show this device. This has nothing to do with silicon photonics, but it's still an optical device, of course. This is the pulse oximeter. I love this device um, for the simple reason. So th this is measuring uh, just in a non-invasive way on your finger. It's, it's simply measuring the, uh, the oxygen saturation uh, in your blood. <clears throat> It's doing that instantaneously, um, no pain, lots of gain. Um, it's very low cost. You buy this device for a few tens of euro. Uh, it just consists of a few semiconductor chips, a few LED chips. Uh, it, it, you shine light at two different wavelengths through the finger, essentially. So two LEDs, a couple of um, photodiodes, a, a little bit of electronics. It's cheap, but it didn't exist 25 years ago. 25 years ago in the hospital, if, if the doctor wanted to know blood saturation, uh, oxygen saturation in the blood, it was finger pricking, go to a lab, and, and the result perhaps one or two hours later. This is inst instantaneous. For me, this is an icon, because it is um, really life-saving, obviously. Oops. It's really life-saving, obviously. Um, it's a cheap device. It's, uh, it's optical technology, which I like, of course. Um, so this is really my idea about where we should be going with silicon photonics. Also, go for applications where a cheap device can do a very important function, and not only uh, in a specialized lab or something, but point of care, doctor's office, uh, etc. And indeed, uh, as we all know, the, in medicine and life science, the, the, the challenges that society faces are, are huge. There is an aging society, and with, it's, it's good that we grow older, but then quality of life preferably should also be good up to the up to the end so enhanced quality of life in the last uh, 10 years of life is a huge challenge uh, keep it all affordable is a huge challenge etc so technology is obviously not everything here but technology can help um, it can help for uh, low cost personal and point of care medical devices uh, minimally invasive devices catheter approaches implants electronic pills uh, rapid diagnostics <coughs> Chip-based technologies are the key here. Um, a chip-based technology drives down cost, and drive down cost is obviously very important to keep it affordable. Um, a chip-based solution is highly compact. Certainly, if you talk about catheter approaches, implants, electronic pills, you'll agree with me that compactness is quite an uh, asset. Um, uh, rapid diagnostics for assays, uh, there the chip is actually a disposable. It's used once. If the chip is disposable, then its cost should be less than a euro, right? So, so chip-based technology, in my view, are a imp very important element in, in this whole uh, situation that we have here. But with that, let, let's go back to silicon photonics. On, on this slide, I'm showing just uh, four classes of types of sensing that you can do with uh, silicon photonics, and, and I'm sure this is not com complete. Uh, there is vibrational spectroscopy, vibrational uh, absorption spectroscopy, or uh, Raman spectroscopy. There is refractive index sensing uh, that is actually quite popular for diagnostics, um, biosensing, also for gas sensing. Um, there is various types of 3D imaging. LiDAR is, is a big hype uh, today for autonomous driving. Uh, there is optical co coherence tomography, there is laser Doppler uh, vibrometry. There is also a readout of fiber sensors, in particular fiber Bragg gratings have many, many applications um, uh, in, in sensing strain of structures that can be civil, uh, civil structures that can be 
uh, oil wells, but that can be medical, uh, measuring a pressure uh, um, on, a, on a heart valve, for example, uh, with a catheter device. Uh, but whenever you have a fiber brack rating, you need to read out the reflected light that comes back from that uh, fiber brack rating, and that readout unit can again be implemented in the form of a silicon photonics chip. I won't have the time to cover um, all of these uh, applications, so I'll go through some of them and uh, select it, uh, as you can imagine, by uh, subjects that we are doing research on. I'll start with um, vibrational uh, spectroscopy. As you all know, uh, every molecule has its natural uh, vibrations that are characteristic for, for the given molecule, uh, vibrations somewhere in the terahertz uh, range, typically. Um, so if you can probe the spectrum of vibration frequencies of a molecule, you know who that molecule is. Um, and you can do that optically in two different ways. Either you shine, and that is uh, infrared abs absorption spectroscopy, which simply means you shine light off the vibration frequency onto the molecule where it gets absorbed. Um, or you do, sorry, or you do uh, Raman spectroscopy, which means that you shine much higher frequencies, uh, shorter wavelength light onto the molecule, and the scattered light will be Doppler shifted, you could say, by the movement of the uh, molecule. We have been working uh, for the past five to ten years, actually, on, on both. And, and, and a first case, and that's uh, infrared absorption spectroscopy, is, is the measurement of glucose in, uh, in uh, bodily fluids, of course. Um, <laughs> Glucose has absorption features both in the 1500 to 1800 nanometer range and also in the so-called combination band, just above two micrometers. Um, so depending on glucose concentration, you will have more absorption. Um, now, uh, these are not very sharp absorption features. It's not like a gas. Uh, they are broad and they're actually also quite weak. Um, so. Uh, Measuring glucose is, is actually a notably difficult optical problem. But it's also a very important problem. The, um, uh, diabetes is an epidemic, as doctors say. The, the prevalence of diabetes in the world is growing uh, dramatically. Uh, it's not exactly understood completely why that is the case. It's not curable, unfortunately. So the best you can do is to manage it. And manage it means that you have to keep uh, glucose levels in your blood between certain limits. Uh, diabetes is not, uh, is not curable, but it's also, it's, it's in principle quite manageable as long as you can keep blood glucose within certain limits. But that means that you have to measure it continuously. You need to do continuous glucose monitoring. Not fingerprint twice a day or three times a day, but measure glucose every five to 15 minutes. Um, and that we hope to do with uh, uh, this absorption spectroscopy. And indeed, this was a, a PhD years ago where we built this uh, silicon photonics chip. And basically, yeah, it, it contains this long waveguide. And, and you can see, because we can make such sharp bands, we can put a, a long length of wave, waveguide on a small area. Uh, and that's what we did on this chip. And then we brought tubing so that we can flow fluids over the chip. So basically, the fluids are the cladding to these waveguides. And there is interaction between light propagating the waveguides and the uh, fluid cladding. And indeed, it worked. Um, we could, uh, what we do here, this is just water plus glucose. That's still easier than uh, blood or serum. Um, but indeed, we applied a certain glucose concentration in the physiological range. We measured the spectrum of light propagating through the waveguide in contact with that fluid. And we could indeed uh, extract uh, the, the glucose concentration. And you see that we have a, a, a nice one-to-one -one, um, relationship. This is glucose in water. works very nicely. It becomes a lot more difficult to do glucose in real biological fluid, because then there is also lactate. There is other. Uh, molecules with a, with a similar absorption spectrum. Um, but nevertheless, uh, this is being worked on. And um, there is work now. And, and meanwhile, this has gone into a spin-off company to develop an, an, a very small implant device, which would just sit under the skin. 
um, through a simple uh, surgical procedure where a device would sit just under the skin, uh, be in contact with uh, interstitial fluid, measure glucose continuously, and read out its data to a, a wireless uh, device. So this is, this is ongoing. This is not yet on the market, to be clear, but this is ongoing. And if it works, it's still high risk, high gain, because it is a notable notably difficult problem to make this a reliable uh, reading of, of blood glucose, uh, but it's such an important problem that we better give it a chance. Back to my uh, vibrating molecule, uh, I'll switch to the other branch, which is uh, Raman spectroscopy. As you know, Raman, um, here you see, uh, this is not a dog, but it's an, an ethanol uh, molecule. Uh, if you shine this pump laser light on it, and you observe the scattered light, you will see this Stokes spectrum at longer wavelength, highly exaggerated by 10 orders of magnitude. It's, extre it's actually extremely weak. And then also the, the anti-Stokes. Uh, and of course, these spectra, this is, an, this is a finger spectra, fingerprint spectrum for, uh, in this case, uh, ethanol. Um, <clears throat> what we have as an ambition is to get away from a typical Raman microscope that will cost you the best of 100,000 euro and is rather bulky. We want to evolve to doing the same on a chip. And the, and the chip may contain an, a laser source integrated onto the chip. It will contain, again, a, a, a long wire of waveguide uh, that interacts with the analyte, and then it will contain a spectrometer. So I'll talk a little bit about this part here, which is the, uh, the, the key part in the whole, in the whole story. Um, what we do here is, is indeed, it's a bit similar to what I said for the glucose case. We, we propagate light through the waveguide, and, and here is the pump light. The analyte molecules are sitting just in the cladding of the waveguide, but as you may know, um, light traveling in a waveguide has an evanescent tail sitting just in the cladding, so there is interaction between photons guided by the waveguide and the analyte in the cladding. And that then creates a Stokes light, of course, and that Stokes light is uh, partly picked up again into, into the propagating mode of the waveguide and is, is continuing its travel in the, in the waveguide. The beauty of this approach, and actually fundamentally different from the Raman confocal microscope, is the fact that we have waveguide length as a parameter to scale the signal intensity. And in a Raman microscope, you don't have that feature. You can't, there is no knob to turn in a, in a confocal microscope to increase the signal. Here we have a knob to turn, which is waveguide length. To the degree that uh, you shouldn't go beyond uh, an extinction due to attenuation, which is more than 1 over e, but, but we, 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 we gain from the length. And in terms of the waveguide, either we use a normal waveguide, and here you see indeed the waveguide cross-section. Here you see what I just said, the guided mode pr propagating in such a waveguide has these evanescent tails, uh, also here and here, that are in, in, in contact with the analyte. An, a variation on the same team is this so-called slotted waveguide. It's like two waveguides, but it's still single-moded, where it's well known that, for, at least for the TE polarization, you have this very strong field enhancement in the slot between the two strips of silicon, and that's exactly where the analyte is sitting. So that gives you a very nice overlap of photons and uh, analyte. And yes, this works if you take just a chip, you put, a, for example, a drop of, uh, in this case, alcohol on it, and you observe the spectrum of what comes out of the waveguide, this is what you see, and you see a number of vibrational uh, peaks, and then you go to a database to compare it with, uh, <clears throat> and you find out which molecule it, it was. Of course, we knew that we put uh, IPA on the chip in this case. And indeed, uh, we could estimate that our efficiency of collection of Stokes light, Stokes Raman light, is actually between a 10 and 100 times better than in a conventional state-of-the-art Raman microscope. Um, we have done that for many substances, not only for liquids, but also for uh, monolayers. I think this is a case of uh, rhodamine. Um, this is actually a case, I'll not go into the details, but where we had uh, labeled DNA. We, we, we functionalized the chip with single-strand DNA and then exposed it to a fluid, and we got the binding of the complementary DNA, which we could, over time, see coming up 
as the peaks of, uh, of a label put on the uh, DNA. So, so the, the trick works. Um, this is not work from ourselves, but from a US group. Uh, the same method has also been used for trace gas detection, where actually on top of the waveguide, they put an, uh, an hypersorbent polymer, um, which adsorbs gas molecules um, with, a very, with a very high partition coefficient, so ratio of uh, density in the gas phase versus ratio of gas molecules in that hypersorbent polymer. And with that, they could uh, uh, get spectra from, from a gas, in this case it was uh, metal salicylate, uh, down to a detection limit of 100 ppb. That's quite, a, quite an impressive result, I believe. Okay, um, we, we are now taking all of this further, and actually we are going a, a little bit away from the normal dielectric waveguide, but we combine the dielectric waveguide now with a plasmonic waveguide. What you see here is, um, this is gold, and you see here a metal, it's, it's, a, it's a slotted metal waveguide. Um, uh, and again, the, the analyte is sitting in this uh, slot, and the slot in this case for a plasmonic slot is, is actually very narrow. It's, it's down to perhaps 20 to 30 nanometers. Uh, gives you a, a huge electric field uh, enhancement in that slot. And, and that is good because Raman, the intensity of the Stokes light in Raman spectroscopy scales with the fourth power of the electric field enhancement. So if you scale the electric field enhancement by a factor 100, then your Raman signal goes up by eight orders of magnitude. So, so that's why we use plasmonics here. Um, that's always the reason by, why many people in the world have been playing with so-called SIRS, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. That's using the combination of plasmonics uh, with uh, Raman. Here we do this with this uh, plasmonic slot waveguide, which we excite from a dielectric waveguide and then uh, pick up the, the Stokes light again in a dielectric uh, waveguide. This was a first example that we reported last year, but at Clio this year we'll report um, a variation on the same team where um, basically making a metal slot of 20, 30 nanometer is not so easy. And you can do that with, with electron beam lithography, but you don't want to use electron beam lithography because it's not scalable to high volume manufacturing. What we did here is the following trick. We start from this slotted waveguide, and this still has a width for the slot of 100 to 100, 150 nanometers. That's easily uh, manufacturable in a, in, an, in, a, in a CMOS fab. So this slot comes out of the CMOS fab. Then we apply layers by means of atomic layer deposition, and atomic layer de deposition, ALD, is, 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 is conformal. So we can coat uh, this structure with a layer of, in this case, alumina. And the thickness here and the thickness on the side walls is equal because of the conformality. So basically, we can narrow down at will the slot from its value of, say, 150 nanometer all the way down to, say, 40 nanometer or so. And then we coat with a thin gold layer, and we now have created a gold metal slot of, say, 20 or 30 nanometer wide in a very easy uh, procedure. And that works, and, and indeed we, are, we were quite astonished, to, uh, to be honest, to, say, to see beautiful spectra from, from this approach. These structures are not long, eh, because the plasmonic structures are heavily absorbing, so they are perhaps four or five micrometers long. Longer doesn't make sense. Uh, but here you see Raman spectra of NTP, that's, uh, that's a molecule that is uh, sulfur bound to the gold in a mol as, as a monolayer. And we see uh, the, the most beautiful spectra that we have ever seen of NTP from this approach. Also bulk liquids like this alcohol gives uh, quite uh, good spectra. So, so we are quite pleased with this approach and not unimportantly the the variability of the strength of the signals is within 5%. Plasmonics and SIRS always has a bit of a suspicion about uh, reproducibility, uh, certainly if you work with nanoparticles. Um, but in this case, uh, the structures are geometrically rather reproducible, and that means that we also get a rather uh, reproducible result. So that was uh, a few examples of um, vibrational spectroscopy. Um, let's move to perhaps, I've, I think I have one example of uh, 3D imaging. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about laser Doppler vibrometry, again in a, in a, in a medical context. 
Um, I guess you all know the Doppler effect. What you do is you have a laser Doppler vibrometer. You send a laser beam to a moving target. So this is moving at a certain velocity. And that obviously implies that the light that is returning back to your LDV is uh, frequency shifted, optical frequency shifted. Um, there is basically you're changing the optical path length. Therefore, you're basically doing phase modulation. So then by a heterodyne or homodyne technique, you recombine that returning light with the original laser light. And you beat them against each other. And with that, you can easily uh, determine the, the, the movement of the, of the target here. What we have been developing uh, over the past years, and we did that in, an, in, a, in a European project called uh, CARDIS, together with Medtronic, one of the bigger um, uh, medical device companies in the world, um, we have been de de developing this silicon photonics chip, which actually contains six of these uh, laser Doppler vibrometers. That's the beauty of doing something on a chip. Multiply by six is done at the design level with a, with, with a click, uh, with, with a single click, so to say. And in manufacturing, doing more of the same is trivial, of course, on a chip. So, so, so in this chip, we have the, the laser is sitting here, and that will be an integrated laser with time. It's split in, in, in a number of in six channels here. At, at some points, six beams leave the chip, so, and they are shining onto a moving target. All the reflections come back. They are picked up in the same place. Um, it's through an imaging system. And then the, the signals are going further. And you may have seen that here we split off part of the laser light. Again, we split it by six to have all our reference signals for the homodyne approach. And we recombine the, the signals from each of these uh, uh, channels with the reference signal. And then we go to a detector and then to electronics. And actually, it works very nicely. And we are now applying this in a medical context, uh, cardiovascular diseases. Um, I already talked about diabetes, one of the big medical problems. But cardiovascular disease is obviously also one of the big ones. Um, the, 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 one of the big problems is here is things like arteriosclerosis, atherosclerosis, and stenosis, things that go back, that go wrong with our uh, arteries. Now, of course, in the medical field, there are already a number of techniques to diagnose these problems, but many of them are not really very um, suitable for the general practitioner. So our hope is to develop a device that can help in preventive medicine so that a, a, a GP can early on detect such problems. And, and, and the idea is that we would basically just, with this laser Doppler vibrometer, monitor movement of skin above the artery. And for example, here, here you see an example. This is, uh, this is somebody's neck. Uh, the carotid artery is running underneath here. So basically, by just monitoring, as, uh, you can obviously feel your heartbeat on the carotid artery. But by carefully monitoring the movement of the, of the skin as the heart beats, and not do it in one position, but perhaps do it in, in two positions, you can actually derive what is called the pulse wave velocity. That is the speed by which the pressure wave upon a heartbeat travels through the uh, artery. And that pulse wave velocity is actually uh, is an indicator for uh, problems such as uh, atherosclerosis. Um, normal values for pulse wave velocities in healthy young people is perhaps uh, around five meters per second. But as the, as the artery stiffens, the, the pulse wave velocity uh, becomes higher, goes to 10 meters per second, and then you better go to the doctor. So this would be a device by which we can, with a, with a, with a device that would look like this, the doctor would shine on your neck, shine on your neck, and, and, and get a reading, um, which is as easy to take and perhaps easier to take than blood pressure, and would give another indicator uh, for risk for cardiovascular uh, disease. So we are now, we have developed the technology over the past uh, couple of years, and we now have a nice device. It's not yet as compact as this, but it's starting to come close. Um, and uh, the preclinical tests on this device will start in the next weeks, actually, um, together with uh, cardiologists. So how am I doing on time? It's all good. 
Okay, uh, because then I would like to spend another uh, five minutes or so on something else that is close to my heart. <clears throat> I already mentioned in the beginning, there is a big missing thing in my whole story. Uh, I talked about beautiful passive functions, modulators, detectors, and all that. But the, the light source so far was not on the chip. And, and, and silicon being, uh, silicon is an indirect uh, band gap semiconductor, so emission of photons is not what silicon likes to do. Um, so necessarily for integrating light sources on a silicon chip, we will have to go to hybrid approaches. There have been some attempts with, uh, with silicon and, uh, and silicon germanium and with erbium doped silicon, etc. None of these approaches has gone very far. Um, we all know that 3.5 semiconductors are perfect for light emission, um, and, and, and they come in many varieties for different wavelength ranges, etc. So really, the key question is, what is an, what is an elegant approach to integrate 3.5 onto silicon, and do that not only in a research lab, but also in a manufacturing fab? That's the, the one billion dollar question here. Um, again, it's actually easy in the lab, not so difficult to, to do it in a very hybrid way. You take a 3.5 chip, you take a silicon chip, and somehow you go package. Uh, it's a bit, a bit difficult because the two chips need to be aligned carefully, and that's perhaps a bit tedious to do, but it works. Um, but what we really want to do is move to true wafer level approaches for 3.5 on silicon uh, integration. I give one example of the first case, so a, a hybrid case, so you, where you take an, um, an, uh, a 3.5 chip and a silicon chip. What you see here is a schematic. What you see here is a schematic of a, of a 3.5 chip. It's a uh, superluminescent uh, LED chip, um, and, and this is a much bigger uh, chip which is the silicon chip. Actually, what you see here is, is the schematic of a tunable laser diode. Because actually, the, the, the S-LED chip is actually a gain block. It is, um, it is a chip that, with this 3.5 waveguide, will provide gain to the light that is propagating in here. Here, there is a high reflective coating. Here, we make sure that we have a low loss coupling from the 3.5 chip into the silicon chip. That's the clumsy part of this uh, story still. And then on the ch silicon chip, we have a variety of structures, and these are optical filtering structures. And basically, they provide um, optical feedback to the gain chip in well-defined well uh, wavelengths, at well-defined well wavelengths. And actually, in this case, I've had it, and these are these lines here, I've had it microheaters. Because if you, if you change the temperature of silicon, its refractive index changes, as you can imagine. So that means that you can actually shift an optical filter by simply microheating locally on the silicon chip the, the devices that provide the wavelength selectivity. In this case, there are these uh, ring resonators. So by playing around with these, the currents through these microheaters, I can change the optical filter, and thereby I can eventually make a tunable laser. This is what we did, and actually we did it here. Here you see a picture. Here you see the 3.5 chip. Actually, this was a chip from uh, our good friends here in, uh, in Vilnius uh, from Brolis. It was a gallium antimonide gain chip. So this operates in the 2.0x uh, micron uh, range. And here you see the start of the silicon chip, but the, the silicon chip is actually much larger. And it, indeed, it works beautifully. Um, in this case, we have three heating elements, and with three heating elements, we can uh, do coarse tuning and fine tuning and ultra fine tuning, and that's what you see here. Um, the, the left curve you see, and this is discrete tuning. You see it, it, it tunes the laser tunes from 2010 nanometer to 2070 nanometer, so that's a relatively broad tuning range, but it's not continuous. It's, it's, it jumps from one peak to the other upon driving up the current to the microheaters. Um, here, this is already finer tuning. You see from 2018 to 2024. And then with the phase section tuning, we, then, we can do extremely uh, fine tuning um, of the device. So by playing with the three, three uh, currents that can come out of an uh, electronic uh, control circuit, we, we have um, 
continuous tuning, uh, single mode tuning, all the way from uh, 2010 to 2070. So you can imagine lots of applications for this. I talked about vibrational spectroscopy. Obviously, such a device would be an ideal device as the source for an uh, uh, absorption spectroscopy measurement, be it glucose or whatever. Yeah. But then we want to, as I said, we want to move away from the clumsy chip-to-chip -chip coupling um, to wafer-scale approaches where, where really you can, at very low cost and high reliability, integrate 3.5 on silicon. Um, this is a bit technical, perhaps, but roughly speaking, there are uh, three approaches that people around the world are studying intensively now to, to do the job. The upper left part is the, is the real dream of everybody. Why don't we simply epitaxially grow 3.5 semiconductor on silicon? Well, the fact is that physics is against you. Uh, people have been trying to grow 3.5 semiconductors on silicon for decades now with limited success. Some success for gallium arsenide, but limited success for iniophosphide. Although I must, I must add that in recent years, um, a couple of groups around the world have made tremendous progress. So five years ago, I would have told you, forget it. Uh, this is never going to work. I'm a bit more careful now. Um, and people use quantum dot technologies, and they grow, and they do growth in narrow, narrow trenches, and that helps to get rid of defects. Uh, it's, it's material science uh, at the extreme level. But I must say, by now, there are a couple of demonstrations of really high quality, low defect, uh, 3.5 material grown directly on, on, on silicon. Which doesn't mean that this will come soon in industrial products, I believe. It will, take, it will still take, I guess, um, five to 10 years before it really matures to manufacturing level. For the time being, there are two other approaches, um, diet to wafer bonding. Um, and, and transfer printing. In diet to wafer bonding, what you do is you take, you, you, you work on the silicon wafer, the large wafer, but you take smaller dyes or small wafers of 3.5. There is not something like a 8 inch 3.5 semiconductor wafer, simply doesn't exist. 3.5 semiconductor wafers are much smaller, so you have a mismatch in wafer size. But you take smaller wafers or even individual dyes and you basically just glue them or bond them, as we say, onto the silicon wafer. Um, after that, you, you remove most of the 3.5 substrate down to the fact that what is left of 3.5 is just the very thin epitaxial layer structure of perhaps a few micrometers thick. And with that structure, you go back to a wafer step, uh, to a wafer fab and do all the patterning to pattern that because here the 3.5 is, is, is just epitaxy, is just uh, layers, and then you pattern it into uh, waveguides with contacts and everything, into a laser, essentially. That's what people do. And, and a variation on the same theme is uh, called transfer printing. Um, I'll not go too much into the details, but, but here we basically first finish a laser onto its host 3.5 substrate, until it's ready, and then with a, with a few magical tricks, we make sure that that laser device is detachable from its original host substrate uh, with tricks. Um, and then we come with a stamp, it's a rubber stamp, and we just uh, pick up a laser from the 3.5 uh, substrate and bring it to the silicon laser. And in principle, that is a a parallelizable process. You can, with a rubber stamp, pick up not one laser, but a thousand lasers and transfer them to the silicon wafer. And, and likely, what I've described here, transfer printing is probably the most scalable technique for uh, integrating 3.5 uh, on, on silicon. But I'll just give a few examples of what we have been doing. Here, for example, you see a cross-section of Indeed. You, you recognize here again a silicon waveguide, so light is propagating uh, normal to the screen here. Uh, here is the 3.5 starts here. And in this case, we use bonding through an, uh, an agent, uh, BCB. It's, it's like a glue, you could say, but then a very thin layer of glue because this layer is perhaps 10 or 20 nanometers uh, thick. 
And, and, and again, as I mentioned earlier, if light is propagating in the silicon waveguide, there is this evanescent tail that extends into the 3.5 and picks up gain. And you can also make light uh, couple from the silicon layer to the 3.5 layer uh, and back. Just a few examples of things we did with that. For example, here you see an example of a directly modulated uh, distributed feedback laser. Um, the, the, the yellow here is, is silicon, the, the bluish here is the 3.5. The grating which you invariably always have in a DFB laser is defined in the, in the silicon. Um, and you see indeed these tapering structures that, that make light move from silicon to silicon level up, up into the 3.5 level and back into the silicon uh, level. And this works uh, really very nice and we achieved, in this case, we achieved even a, a direct modulation bandwidth up to 56 uh, gigabit per second, which is actually not so easy to do in a 3.5 only uh, DFB laser. Here is another example of the same. This is a mode locked laser. Um, here we have uh, part of the cavity is 3.5 again. Of course, the gain part is 3.5 and also the saturable absorber that provides mode locking. But then the, the long passive part that we need in a mode locked uh, laser and that defines the repetition rate of the pulses is defined all in the, in the yellow part, which is the silicon. Um, here you see the chip again. Here is the, the long spiral. Uh, probably a few millimeters or centimeters long, I don't remember, which is in the silicon waveguides. The losses in silicon waveguides are considerably lower than in 3.5 waveguides, so that boosts the performance of these uh, mode lock lasers. And here you see the 3.5 uh, device. And this really works very nicely, and, and we have really a beautiful mode locked laser where we have many, many, many thousands of individual uh, lines in the spectrum of this uh, mode, mode locked laser and actually a very, very pure uh, phase noise uh, spectrum. This is a comp laser. Um, I mentioned transfer printing, but I'll not dwell too much into this. Uh, but as I say, in, in, in transfer printing, what we do is we make sure that at some point the, the device, this is a DFB laser, for example, it's a 3.5 laser, it's made ready to be picked up but of course, to be able to pick it up, you have to make sure that the layer underneath here, underneath has to be gone. So we, we uh, selectively etch away the layer underneath the laser device, keep it in place by a few tethers here, and then with a stamp, the rubber stamp, uh, pick it up and bring it to the silicon. That's essentially what we do. Um, and indeed here, this is how it would work in a manufacturing fab. This is the silicon uh, wafer. Um, here are one or two, three, five source wafers. You come with your rubber stamp, you pick up devices. The rubber stamp can be such that you uh, change pitch, so to say, because the pitch of the silicon chips may be different from the, uh, the pitch here, but the, the, that will be defined by these uh, uh, little uh, things on the, on the rubber stamp that you pick up these four devices, for example, and put them here, and pit, pick, up, pick up the four yellow devices and put them here, for example. So uh, this is how we think it will work. And here you see indeed uh, examples of our first devices in this matter. And we are actually uh, proud to say that in the past months we have for the first time uh, made successful, successfully um, excellent uh, DFB lasers by this uh, method on, on, on silicon. I think this brings me to a conclusion. Um, so I've talked you into the field of um, silicon photonics. Again, I can't overemphasize uh, silicon photonics exists not because silicon is such an interesting optical material, on the contrary, but simply because the silicon world is big and has extremely mature technology that we misuse or abuse or use for our, for our good. Um, that is really, and, and there is extremely strong industrial traction now for telecom, datacom, interconnect applications. Um, I also emphasize that it's not just limited to telecom wavelengths, 1.3, 1.5 micron, the, the fiber optics world, but, but you can also go into the visible, all the Raman work was in the visible. You can go to the mid-infrared, I mentioned the, uh, the, the two micron uh, tunable laser. And I really believe that while today the, 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 the major driver is telecom, datacom, etc., I really believe that give it another five to ten years and 
all these applications in sensing, especially life science uh, oriented and medical, uh, will likely become highly important. And, and actually, I believe that the markets in those sensing fields eventually will be considerably larger than the, than the, than the markets in telecom and, and, and datacom. With that, I would like to acknowledge, uh, indeed, as, uh, as was uh, said in the beginning, uh, I'm from a big group in Ghent, Photonics Research Group, uh, close to 100 people, about 50 PhD students, eight professors, 15 postdocs approximately. Um, I also have to thank IMAC. We are using the beautiful technology of a research CMOS fab, uh, which is very performant. And of course, uh, research costs money, so I have to acknowledge uh, funding from many uh, funding bodies, national and, 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 and European, and uh, ERC in particular. As a very last thing, I would like to make uh, a little bit of publicity. If, if anybody in the room is interested to learn more about silicon photonics, we will be organizing another summer school on silicon photonics. We have been doing that uh, already a couple of times. Um, it will happen uh, in June this year in Ghent, uh, Belgium. Um, and actually, uh, back to back with it, there will also be a, a hands-on design course of another week. So the first week is summer school. That is the broad introduction to the whole field and all the, um, the technologies, the concepts, etc. But then the second week is behind, behind, the, behind the computer and doing hands-on uh, exposure to designing your own chip, essentially. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. So thank you for this excellent talk. Thank I you. really enjoyed every slide of it. So while I have a uh, few questions of my own, but maybe I'd like to start with uh, questions from the audience. Do we have any questions? Audrey? Yeah, really exciting talk. Uh, I have a few questions about the last part. Uh, two questions, actually. So first about growing three fives on, 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 on silicon that you mentioned. I think uh, in the 80s or even 70s, Kromer had this paper about germanium gallium arsenide interface. And actually, the, the conclusion was that it very much depends on the face on the surface. If it's a one, one, one surface, I think what you get is this polar catastrophe. And polar catastrophe, it's either killed by the metallic layer, or you have to produce the defects that mm. uh, counteract it. So I think the only solution is one, zero, zero. And I think just physics works against you. you, you, you I think Kromer worked it out that you, it, there are some faces that you can make, some faces that you cannot. But then I also wanted to ask about, uh, I don't remember, five or six years ago, I saw many papers uh, about uh, designing silicon germanium super lattices that would kind of have a direct band gap and a strong dipole transition. And that would allow you to, to, to grow this on the chip. So any chance, any progress, because you have to tune the, the super lattice very precisely, if I remember. Is there any commercial future for this? Hmm. Well, to come back, um, first of all, to come back on the 3.5 on silicon, uh, there has been, on, in, in the field of 3.5 on silicon, which has been a big field for obvious reasons for the past 20, 30 years, there, has been, there have been some successes on growth of gallium arsenide on silicon, and, and often through an intermediate of uh, germanium. Um, so that has worked reasonably well, but of course, indiophosphite is more difficult. The lattice mismatch between indiophosphite and silicon is already 8%. Gallium arsenide to silicon is only 4%. So the lattice mismatch is the first problem. And then indeed, uh, silicon is a non-polar semiconductor. Three fives are polar. So that is the other problem. You create domains, and it's not so easy to, to, get, rid of, uh, to get rid of that. So there are lots of problems. Um, but as I mentioned, in the case of indiophosphite, um, there has been remarkable progress in, uh, in, in recent years, but never with just f uh, flat 2D growth onto a surface. It's always with some sort of uh, patterning um, or quantum dot uh, approach. To come back to the silicon germanium, the, the, the most spectacular result come, came from MIT, uh, perhaps five, six, seven years ago, uh, Jürgen Mitchell in, um, 
in MIT reported a laser uh, based on uh, an even electrically pumped laser based on uh, germanium silicon on, on silicon. And the trick is indeed that by um, going to very, very high doping on one hand and also by going to rather extreme uh, straining the semiconductor, you can bring germanium uh, just, just about in the transition from indirect to direct. The fact is, the fact is that if you looked at the results and if you sort of on, a, on the back of an envelope calculate what the associated threshold current density was, that was two to three orders of magnitude higher than what you expect from a normal decent laser. Um, so, and since then, we haven't heard much about it anymore. So I fear the physics simply doesn't work. So I think the story of doing it with germanium is over. There is still hope for other compounds. There is germanium tin, etc. cetera. There, there is still work going on that looks promising, perhaps. But again, this is rather fundamental material science and not anywhere close to devices, leave it alone, market. Thank you. Do we have, uh, yeah, please. Um, I'll give you a microphone. If you... I, have a, I have a question about terminology. I hear a lot of people uh, talking about lab on a chip, but I didn't hear you say that once. And I'm curious, is that really a real thing? Uh, or is this just something that people like to use, lab on a chip? Can you define it? For me? Well, I use that term also quite regularly. I didn't do so to date, but uh, lab on a chip, yeah, simply means that you have a sensing system that is built on a chip, no more, no less, right? So in its general, generality, that's quite an appropriate term, I think. Uh, often lab on a chip will mean that you have a sensing function, that you have a means to bring an analyte onto that chip, which is, if it is liquid, often an, a microfluidic system. Um, and that you have, uh, yeah, and, and that's, that's, that's basically what it is, a lab on a chip, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure there is a big confusion about the terminology here. Um, it's a sensing system on a chip. So if that answered your question, do we have more questions from the audience? Yeah. Do you expect that in the future, uh, do you expect that in the future maybe photonic uh, circuitry will be competing with electronic circuitry? How you think? Because of speeds of such or energy uh, per bit on, or something like that? Um, well, I think that's a multifaceted question, I believe. Um, so the question is, will photonics take over from electronics in certain ways? So that's what you're asking, I think. Well, um, if you take, well, the, 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 the key question here is really, will forms of optical computing become relevant? Because if you say electronics, then it's really computing, with, which is where electronics is really at its best. And we all use extremely powerful computers in our uh, smartphones, etc. Um, so is there a chance that um, optical forms of computing will take over? Um, to be honest, personally, I've always been a skeptic uh, on that. However, uh, there is quite a lot of work nowadays on um, things called by the name of brain-inspired computing and neuromorphic computing, uh, reservoir computing, uh, forms of computing that are completely different from the, the classical von Neumann architecture in digital computing. Um, and indeed, a number of computing problems are notably hard for a classical computer. Uh, uh, recognition of patterns in a 2D or 3D uh, world is, is notably, notably diff difficult. And there is some hope from the community of uh, neuromorphic computing that uh, concepts of neuromorphic computing may be doing better there. And some of these concepts can be implemented in an optical way. And actually, one of my colleagues in Ghent is exactly working in this field 
to, to work in the direction of a photonic chip that is, uh, that is doing computing functions. I believe all of this is still very much, um, still very much fundamental research and it, I think it, it will take a long time before uh, a photonic computer will get to yeah, it's difficult to say when. Um, yeah, it's very difficult to say. Uh, not in the next 10 years, I believe. Um, so that it, it will take a long while. Um, I should also mention, and that's a different facet of the same question. Um, so obviously, f silicon photonics exists by the, uh, because we have access to these microelectronic fabs. Um, but there we still have a bit of a problem. Um, the volumes that microelectronic fabs are running in terms of wafers per month um, are, are vast. And up to today, the markets for silicon photonics, as compared to that, are tiny. So for, so for these microelectronic fabs, the, the motivation to move into silicon photonics is still non-trivial uh, because in their overall business, Silicon photonics is really, really very tiny. Nevertheless, you see that the things, certain things happen in the world, and I mentioned in the beginning that uh, the biggest foundry in the world, TSMC, has decided to go for it. So it must be that they have uh, business models and that they have looked into it and that they believe that with time, uh, the volume associated with silicon photonics is no longer going to be completely neg negligible as it is today. But the microelectronics fab runs thousands of wafers per month, and uh, today there is no market for silicon photonics that comes anywhere close, uh, of course. You mean the coupling of two chips? Yeah. Well, the, it's tricky because the waveguides, remember the dimensions of the waveguides, they are on the silicon side, they are like 500 nanometers wide. Now you taper them a little bit so that they are perhaps a few micrometers wide, but, but um, coupling two chips together with an accuracy of say a misalignment of one micrometer um, is not so easy. Well, it's doable, and, and actually in flip chip, in flip, chip, flip chip technology, that's exactly what people are doing. Um, and that works, but it's difficult to imagine that that will lead to a solution that is really low cost. It's already a bit packaging-like, and packaging is always sort of expensive. Okay, I'm afraid that uh, we are running out of time. I just would like to have add one more question from myself or question. So would you agree that it's kind of silicon photonics is an illustration where we really align to existing technology platforms to enable completely new applications? And I think probably this is the most important thing, right? So instead yeah, of sure, sure, uh, yeah. inventing new technologies for manufacturing yeah. and so on, we align to existing, you know, mass market scalable uh, you know, technologies. Integrated photonics has suffered exactly from the problem that for many years, people have been working in what is called integrated optics since the 1960s, yes. but they were working on a variety of platforms from exotic materials such as lithium niobate to silica to gallium arsenide to, sorry if I call 3.5 uh, exotic, but um, <laughs> the problem was that um, the technology you need in integrated photonics is necessarily something that has to be quite uh, advanced but you can only make something rather advanced if you have a critical mass of activity. And integrated optics was going around loops, not progressing much because the market wasn't there. There was a chicken and egg problem. The market wasn't there, therefore the critical mass wasn't there. So there wasn't sufficient investment to bring those technology platforms to sufficient maturity. With the case of silicon photonics, we have changed overnight the situation. Uh, we have gotten rid of our problem of having to develop a mature platform. It's out there. And that's, the, that's what made it big. Okay, thank you. So let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> <laughs>